Stu Pendis, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on Cyber Judo tonight. Um, we have an extra special Cyber Judo session for you guys, uh, talking about cyber threat intelligence, particularly around hunting, analyzing, and looking for advanced uh, threats within your network and within your organization. So uh, Ryan Johnson is going to be uh, jumping in for this night's session and presenting and going through a lot of the content that he's developed for the team here. Uh, Ryan has been really enthusiastic about uh, cyber intelligence uh, since I've had the opportunity of meeting him about what, plus or minus six months ago. Yeah. Uh, and you come from a data science background primarily, which is really kind of intriguing and enlightening in the fact of like your perspective in looking at cyber threat intelligence, right? That's correct. It's definitely been a helpful process uh, to understand actually the, the, the what of what you're protecting and then the database structures and so on and so forth. Fantastic. And absolutely love your analytical mindset. So that being said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to keep my lips peeped here until you tell me to, to chime in or anything like that. Travis and myself will watch the comments as you start to jump right into it. And uh, does that sound fantastic? That sounds like a perfect plan. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat, unmute yourself, anything else. We just want to make this as interactive as possible. So, uh so to begin, I'll start actually by uh, thanking Travis and Christian for this opportunity to talk about cyber threat intelligence. Uh, so first, I wanted to start with the understanding the role of a cyber threat intelligence analyst. So analysts, they're primarily responsible for defending organizations, but the question often comes that how are they different than the blue team in general, or are they even a part of the blue team? And it's important to see their role as almost threat focused and hunting uh, because they're looking at mitigating breaches in order to prevent further compromise and inform senior leadership's decision making. Uh, the CTI analysts are more or less investigators. They work to understand who the attacker is uh, they analyze their TTPs, and they do this for the purpose of building out threat profiles so that they're able to have a better understanding of the risk management framework that their company should have. So CTI analysts serve that preventative and response function. They can range from triaging, vulnerability, and risk management support, information sharing, and resource allocation. Uh, the strength of a CTI team is its diversity of backgrounds, cultures, subspecializations, education, and personal interests. For example, geopolitics is incredibly helpful when navigating APTs. Uh, CTI analysts have that hunters uh, and scouts mindset. They want to go beyond the network, beyond the castle, because they think that the best defense is offense and getting themselves in, in the mind frame of an, of a, of an attacker. The CTI Real quick thing here. My apologies for, for interloping. So spooky action at a distance here. Can you refresh us? The CDN is not loading some of the fantastic pictures we got. So just go right up and just refresh it just a couple of times there. And we should see some pretty pictures pop up. This is, by the way, I'm not trolling or making a joke. It's not like a Rick Rule picture. I like slid in there like, ah, I got you. Okay. Yeah. Here, let's uh, scroll down today. Um, there we go. Fantastic. Okay. You got the latest version of it. Bing, bada, boom. I wanted to make sure we had some nice illustrations to go along with some of the fantastic content you got. Uh, continue, good sir. Thank you. So the CTI analyst's role is to provide actionable threat intelligence. Not only should you be able to explain what and how something is happening in the attacks, but it's important to be able to remediate the vulnerability as well. Um, CTI analysts usually get a bad rap because of the fact that they're viewed as people who are able to tell good war stories, but it's tough to explain how the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And so at this point, um, we're going to jump in and look at this graphic here where we're looking at, uh, at threat intelligence as a whole. You can see kind of all of the components that feed into what a threat intelligence team does and how they draw from a wide variety of sources, uh, both that computer function, the AI function, and also the human interfacing such as times on the dark web, social media and forums, because you have to be on the tip of the sphere once it comes to actually understanding cyber threats. And the strange part is the greatest challenge CTI analysts actually confront are themselves because bias is one of the greatest challenges to overcome. 
Uh, one of the things that I consistently harp on coming from a data science background is primarily the concept that you're inherently part of the experiment. Whether you understand that or not, when you run a statistical test, that's you inserting yourself into the, the overall experiment. And so when it comes to cognitive biases, we all have them, whether we're ready to accept them or not. Our upbringing, our education and experiences will create these. For example, I may have a, an attribution theory that Christian is just going to deliver the payload on my computer, but in fact, it's Michael Hallman ready to go. And uh, then these biases, they create a tunnel vision because now I'm unwilling to accept anything that would go against my theory, but also I'm not able to accept outside sources that are needed to be considered. And this just leads to the inaccurate and illogical reasoning. And the confirmation bias is deadly uh, when you have this viewpoint because you're only producing the results that you sought to discover in the first place. And this leads to malattribution and false intelligence. So how do we avoid that? We look at leaning on structured analytic techniques, SATs. That's how we anchor the investigation and logic. And it begins with knowledge, first of yourself, then of your team, and then also the concept of looking for new approaches in your cyber threat intelligence workflow. Um, the concept of having overlapping tools is important and also not to go back to your, to your old ways because you found that they've worked in the past. Uh, being adaptable and open to new approaches in CTI is incredibly important. So, Ryan, you said yes. that Intel and NIST get a bad rap and that is the most true statement I've ever heard as someone who's worked with hundreds of Intel analysts. And it's because they, there, it's a bunch of people who have to predict the future, right? And as good as you can be, and they can be really good, nobody remembers the times you're good, right? They remember the time that you were wrong. And that time that you were wrong sticks with you as a reputation, not just with you, but with your industry and the perception of the industry. It's such a hard field in that sense to explain to and, and maintain the trust with everybody else in the industry, all the decision makers that you're trying to feed this intelligence to when what you're doing is predictive analysis, right? You're trying to tell the future based on what you think the malicious actors are gonna do or the, the, the nation states or whatever intel situation that you're in, right? You, you are taking in inherently inconsistent and flawed information, trying to rationalize it and fuse it down into something that is actionable and then providing your best guess for a decision maker to make a defense against. It is something that is not an exact science, but it is treated as an exact science. So I really appreciate that you, that you mentioned it, that they, they do get a bad rap for that. And it's not something that is unique to cyber threat intelligence that is everything in the intelligence community you know you the best analyst best analysis you can do is still at the end of the day a really really educated guess and that's important to understand you can't you can't hang your hat on intel on intelligence no matter how good it is sorry sorry for interrupting no that's a really great point like you were pointing to, it's almost like being the weatherman and having the forecast exactly switch it. on you. You know, in, in military units, the intel guy is the weatherman. We, we also include a weather analysis. <laughs> That's great. And so um, that leads us to the next component of this, which is the types of threat intelligence. There is four primary forms, strategic, tactical, technical, and operational intelligence. And it's important to understand these differences because when you're looking at data, you have to ask, you have to ask clearly defined questions. And when you know the differences between each of these categories, you're finally able to categorize the findings, uh, develop that database if necessary, and establish guidelines for the data collection and processing, ultimately resulting in a threat profiling report. So to go over these four types, uh, the strategic, they're important for the higher level audience, uh, like your CEOs, your CISOs, uh, and other executives within the company, and basically trying to plead your case for the intelligence that you're trying to deliver to them. The second type is tactical. This is where your conversations are usually going with your network defenders. You're providing specific information about how malicious actors execute the attacks. 
and this is critical. Uh, te the technical part is relating the indicators of specific attacks that organizations can look out for, especially when it comes to social engineering. And that's another thing that you would tie in with, with your SOC team. And then the operational is the details of the known security incidents or campaigns. And all of these tie together uh, to have a unified front when it comes to communicating the actionable intelligence plans. And so then that leads to the threat intelligence life cycle. This one, for, for anyone who's interested in, uh, scroll up just, just, a, just a hair, for anyone who's interested in uh, government work, working in the DOD or the Intel community, which is the whole government really is 16 agencies, there's a little bit of a difference in this nuance and that strategic in the government um, you know, the way they use that word means nation and nation, right? Uh, US v Russia, that's strategic level intelligence. Uh, the European theater, that area, that specific area would be operational. Tactical would be a very specific area within that. So if you were looking at a specific threat actor that's targeting Kiev, that would be tactical level intelligence. And then technical would be even more specific TTPs within that tactical area. So those terms are used differently in civilian versus government um, parlance. And that's just an important thing to know if that is a, uh, an area of employment that you're seeking. That's a great point, Travis, thank you. And so moving on to the threat intelligence life cycle, it's important. Uh, especially in threat intelligence, not to miss the forest for the trees, because that's how the malattribution occurs and the false intelligence is acted upon and the consequences of that are dire. So the traditional intelligence focuses on six distinct phases that make up what is called the intelligence cycle, the direction, collection, processing, analysis, dissemination, and feedback. And so there's many ways to look at the threat intelligence life cycle and mostly that's done through the threat modeling process. Uh, but as a precursor, when you're looking to begin your threat modeling, it's important to understand your organizational infrastructure. What would attackers actually be looking for that you have? What data, what intellectual property, where is it located? Who has access to these things? Reviewing the file logs are incredibly important and having that plan in place is critical. You have to determine what data and intellectual property is your competitive advantage if it's in a business environment. Uh, if it's actually in the government role, we know that there are certain, certain uh, insights that the government has that would provide geopolitical advantage to another country. And so it's important to have the plans in place to protect these. So how will the threats affect operational capacity and business continuity? We've seen time and time again with the airlines recently, and now even looking at the railroads, uh, how these threats are affecting their operational capacity and business continuity, the amount of money that's lost and making that case of how cyber threat intelligence is a critical component of a cybersecurity budget isn't always easy, especially because there's been so many cases of malattribution and, and, and failed uh, actionable insights. It's, it's important to build reasonable cases and to have supporting evidence. And to understand what the intelligence requirements of your organization are, if I'm working at Lockheed Martin on the F-35, it's going to be very different than what the intelligence requirement is for my mom and pop shop. Not, and that setup is a critical difference. Um, and that's, for the most part, uh, not, not having that set in budget. Uh, to have these large security teams are the reasons why mostly that cyber threat intelligence is outsourced and not a part of a main blue team strategy, uh, just due to the toll on the payroll, more or less. That's, that's a great point. I mean, it takes a tremendous amount of time and money to do a, to do a real intelligence fusion center. It's, it, I mean, unless you're a massive corporation, it's, it's not something that you would have in-house that would be feasible you know have, having one guy on payroll who's doing threat intelligence for your organization is it, it that's a joke right that, i mean that's that's why organizations like CISA and all the rest of the intelligence community really really exist right because and you know other other civilian organizations like uh verizon's got a massive threat intelligence capacity at t does too there are a few others as well like it is a 
tremendous undertaking to set up an Intel capacity. Great point there. And so this, this is why it's important to take a data-driven approach and ask reasonable questions based on the available data. And that's the key point is what data is actually available to you. Um, and, and also is that, is that intelligence gained? Are those attributes verifiable through other sources? So looking at your internal data with available open source data and doing that cross check is a key component. Uh, so critical to the identification of threats is using that threat categorization methodology, uh, such as stride, which is um, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and escalation, I mean, elevation of privilege, or a value-based risk model such as dread, which can be utilized, the damage, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. One of the things that I'll note, by the way, for some folks is that um, organizations that are trying to threat model their environments, their infrastructures, their systems, their applications, if uh, an organization is more of a quote unquote Microsoft type of shop, then generally what I would tend to recommend is going with a stride um, methodology when it comes to threat modeling. The reason being is that Microsoft actually developed it and Microsoft actually has a free threat modeling tool. No, it doesn't cost you any money or anything like that um, that leverages the, the Stride framework. Also, it aligns really well with like Azure DevOps as well as the rest of the Microsoft security ecosystem. Um, if you're an organization that's less Microsoft centric and you're looking for threat modeling tools, OWASP has what's called OWASP uh, Dragon, or I believe OWASP Threat Dragon, uh, which is a free threat modeling tool. And you can do both Stride and Dread with uh, that one. I happen to prefer Dread a little bit, mostly because I'm a simpleton and I like to focus on that damage reproducibility and exploit uh, how much something could be exploited and how many people in the organi organization does that really affect. So, you know, I find that it's very easy to wrap your head around. So just a quick note on that one. In, in government parlance, you'll, you'll hear two major uh, acronyms for that kind of stuff, MLCOA and MDCOA, a most likely course of action of the bad guy and a most dangerous course of action of the bad guy, right? There's, and it becomes two different intel assessments. What is the, the worst case scenario that the malicious actor or, you know, uh, adversarial nation state, what is the worst case scenario they could do? That's the most dangerous course of action. What is the most likely course of action? What, meaning, what are they probably going to do, right? Those are the two intel assessments that you always give whenever, you, whenever a, uh, Intel analyst is providing a threat briefing to to anybody who's a decision maker, and I'll, you can definitely frame those in stride or dread in the in uh, in, in the cyber sense. But you want to make sure that you capture both of those scenarios uh, anytime you are doing an Intel briefing. Absolutely, and most of the pen tests I write. <laughs> yes, so. CTI analysts place the emphasis on understanding the who and the why. And so categorizing a threat is important uh, and understanding where the adversary falls into the categorization. Are they hacktivists, cyber criminals, cyber spies, or unknown entities? Hacktivists are personally, politically, or religiously motivated. Their end goal is to publicly embarrass their opponents and advance their cause. Uh, they have a preference for DDoS attacks, website defacements, and data leaks with sensitive information, uh, as well as a history of medium to high success. We have great examples of this, like WikiLeaks, Anonymous, LulzSec, and et cetera. The cyber criminals, on the other hand, they're financially motivated. They're looking primarily to target individual consumers by way of social engineering. Uh, an interesting note on this is looking at cybercrime as a service where criminals can pay for cybercrime services on the dark web. Uh, a really great video done on this topic is actually John Hammond with David Bomble and they explore actually how, how to go on the dark web and, and how this infrastructure as a service is set up and what that actually looks like in the wild. Uh, so highly recommend looking at that. Uh, cyber criminals like to sell compromised data and malware on their dark web, and they utilize cryptocurrency for the transactions because it provides an additional layer of anonymity. And another key thing on the dark web is the categorizations of malware. 
There's the commodity malware, which is publicly available for general utility and custom malware, which is case specific with advanced detection illusion capabilities, which are usually um, bought and purchased by nation state actors. A key point is that malware can be bought or leased so that its availability is even more widespread by the day. And, and most cyber criminals are after credentials, ransom, or compromising point of sale systems. And the most crafty category of cyber criminals um, are looking into infrastructure as a service because it provides that additional layer of anonymity. The, the responsibility of the cyber criminal consumer is to stage and distribute the malware while they provide a portion of their profits to the service provider and administer the C2 services. And what you're often going to see is bulletproof hosting. They're looking to adopt the popular infrastructure as a service where the malware is hosted, botnets can be controlled, and the illegal activity or their end goals are actually carried out. Uh, for those who are wondering what botnets are, they're a network of infected computers controlled by an individual. They're used for DDoS attacks or spam phishing attacks, and they're incredibly useful in evading detection by law enforcement. Because the hosting providers are usually unaware that cyber criminals are utilizing their systems for this purpose. Cyber espionage has a different goal. They want to steal sensitive information for the purposes of geopolitical advantage against adversaries. Their key signature, as I discussed a little bit above, is a custom advanced malware. A massive attack campaign with frequent changes in infrastructure usually indicate uh, cyber espionage is behind it. They're the most likely to have zero day exploits in their arsenal. But also an interesting note is a watering hole attack popularity. They like to use watering holes where attackers focus on a specific website. So uh, for example, they, they could put uh, a redirected version of your Verizon account. And every time you go to this Verizon uh, webpage, you're looking at the page where they infect it with malware and compromise your machine and network. And they usually do this by placing an HTML iframe, which redirects visitors to the attacker-controlled infrastructure, and then covertly downloads malware in the web page's source code. So it's an incredibly tricky uh, attack. Let's talk about that one for a second. So we actually see that vulnerability all the time. Um, it, not all the time, all, quite a bit, where if a web page, especially a login portal, is not configured with the proper security headers, being that either a content security policy with the uh, um, frame ancestors directive or an X frame options header, a malicious actor can embed that that website into their own iframe on their own site. So for somebody who's looking at it, it is the real website. It is perfect it, there's no there's no indicators that it's not the right website right you're embedding it into an iframe and then what a malicious actor will do is they'll put additional uh, invisible html elements over it with some web trackers to capture the input on the username the password the mfa code all those things and steal credentials that way so it is actually a very easy thing to remediate in that you just need to configure your http security headers a little bit better but it is a very common vulnerability that we see out there. And it's a very easy to exploit um, vulnerability when you're doing social engineering attacks. So I mean, it, it, it's, not, it's not a challenging thing. It's, it's very much out there, but it is easily defend, defended against if you know what you're looking for. That's a great point. And so now we're moving to the heart and soul of what CTI is about, and that's attribution, where you're focused on the infrastructure, persona, malware, and targeting of an attacker. The goal of attribution is to understand the hacker's motives and identity. Uh, attribution requires facts and evidence. Assumptions are going to lead to a dead end. The danger of assumptions is the misguided intelligence that's used to inform decisions on vulnerability management. While you focus your efforts on one front, it opens the opportunities for other attack vectors to come into the picture, especially with limited resources that most organizations have. Um, when thinking about attribution, it's important to realize that people are creatures of habit. Think about how much can be told about you specifically by open source repositories. Hackers have their go-to tools, attack vectors, and malware, and 
sometimes it takes a length of time to conclude your investigation. It could take periods of years uh, to gather enough data to make an attribution possible. Uh, so in other words, nothing is wasted and CTI does take an extended period of time, which is where the frustration can grow at their strategic level. So it's important to be able to defend uh, your utility and capabilities as a CTI analyst. Yeah, it's not unusual at all for an, for an Intel uh, project, if you will, to be multi-year long. And it, it's a constant process of giving it your best guess, collecting more in, information, analyzing that information to turn it into intelligence, refining your assessment. And that's the current, that's the constant Intel cycle that Ryan described in the beginning. It, in, Intel is in, it, there's no deliverable, right? There's no end point at the deliverable. It's a constant cycle where that deliverable continuously gets updated until the point where leadership determines we no longer need that deliverable and then the emphasis changes somewhere else. So, it, you know, you, you're always giving like a, you know, here's a 60% answer and that, we're going to try to get to a 65, get, try to get to a 70, try to get to a 75. Oh, the priorities changed. Okay, we're going to try to do this other thing. It, it, it's a, the, you never win with Intel. It's always something that's changing. Absolutely. And that's uh, to talk to the point that Travis was discussing earlier. We're going to talk about confidence levels. Uh, and this is important to state because it's the concept of seldom affirm, never deny. Uh, very often, it's difficult to have 100% confidence in an absolute certainty when you're building out a threat profile. And so the lowest level is low, which is circumstantial and weak evidence that has major gaps. So then the next level is moderate, little evidence with additional secondhand information or circumstantial evidence, high confidence, conclusive evidence from multiple components of the attribution model. And once again, this is the reliance on the framework that you decided uh, uh, ahead of time in order to build out that threat profile. Yes, there's the constant refinement that goes about through the process, but making sure everybody is on the same page when it comes to the threat modeling and the data storage plan is incredibly important. And what is one of the main downfalls in the projects that fail, so to speak. And always consider that the evidence may be purposefully misleading to guide one to false attribution and false intelligence. Because if you're an APT, you would like to have another country blamed when it's you, in fact, because the political repercussions are high. Uh, for example, we're seeing how China responded to the to their balloon surveillance, uh, saying it, saying that this was was a mistake in a weather balloon that got blown off course, but when it was discovered uh, that it had additional intelligence capabilities, then the world knew exactly what the reason for their flight was. So the attribution process, the first step is to gather all the attributable data from all of the sources. Uh, and that kind of goes to the three Vs of data, the volume, how, like how much data are you able to collect, the variety of data, uh, what sources are, is the data coming from? And then the veracity, how true is this data? Is it something that you can depend on reasonably? And the st second step is to assess the data with a metric and analytic focus. Create the timeline, examine the log files and extract pertinent information such as the domains and IP addresses. Examine the malware because these are the basic foundations for building out the rest of the threat profile. That leads to the next step of building the case. What other attributes do you have? Are there strings written in certain languages? Uh, what's the confidence in these attributes? Then eventually you're going to get pushed to the point where you have to form your hypothesis. And like all sciences, uh, your hypothesis may be absolutely wrong. But say in a, in a team setting, usually there's going to be multiple competing hypotheses. And each person almost like a court case will be defending their hypothesis. So when you have a hypothesis, come to uh, prepare to defend it and have your attributes and evidence ready for your case. Uh, and then lastly, are there outliers that can lead to additional attribution theories? Uh, the last step is debating. 
when you're in the war room, so to speak, you have to evaluate the evidence objectively. You rank your competing hypotheses and attributions. Uh, you need someone to play devil's advocate, which is usually the rest of the team. One person is defending the position, and you have to be incredibly skeptical of each theory and pit, poke holes in it, find every weakness, because leaving every stone unturned is is not not the best way to go about it. So working to formulate the most likely hypothesis is the outcome of this meeting. You have to conduct the competence assessment. So you state what you know so far and how confident you are in that. And you create the documentation to support it. And you communicate the knowledge and results with others in the community. And just like the Intel cycle, that, that's a cycle in itself. Right, your, your intel assessment as you go through that attribution and that process of defining where you're attributing a threat and all of those things, that can change by the day. That, and Dane, who was on the team, was also an intel officer with me. He'll, he'll attribute that. That can change by the hour, by the half an hour, by the 15-minute increment. And when you are the intel analyst or the cyber threat intelligence analyst, you need to also... Uh, not just predict what the threat is going to do, you kind of also need to predict what the devil's advocate on your team is going to do and could present, because it is often a very adversarial conversation, not in a bad way, but in a inherently like, oh, I don't think they're going to do that kind of way. You need to definitely understand both sides of what you what you think the malicious actor or the nation state or whatever, whoever your threat is, is going to do, but also you need to understand what your team who's not Intel is going to think that they're going to do, right? Because you need to be able to be that convincing factor to persuade, not necessarily with authority, right? You need to be able to persuade with influence, not authority, to convince the people that are on your team to come around to your side of your side of thought. So it's a, it's a matter of making a very cohesive, very well thought out argument of what the most likely course of action is going to be so that you can pre uh, preposition your entire team to start that process ahead of time to defending against that most, most likely course of action. And it's, it's tough. It, it, it's, it's a tough gig, but it, it is a matter of understanding. You need to understand both sides of it. You need to understand the attacker side and the defending side to be able to really make a good intel estimate. Absolutely. And so to look at the baseline attribution tips, it's important to keep in mind the distinction between the hypothesis and assessment. Oftentimes, the, the competing hypothesis battle is dragged out and even brought into the assessment because it was improperly ranked. And you're at that point, not supposed to be making official statements without the sufficient level of supporting evidence and data. Um, and to be to, to be honest and candid about your level of confidence in that assessment. Uh, the CTI team's inherently part of the experiment, as I said before, don't base your investigation off of inclinations because the pride comes before the fall. Uh, take that juror's mindset, consider the evidence before drawing your certain conclusions and, and keep your bi cognitive biases in check and seek to eliminate them as much as possible. But we know as human beings, it's, an, it's near impossible to do that. And that's why having a diverse team with uh, very different backgrounds and approaches to problem solving are so critical because eventually there's going to be enough overlap and experience and camaraderie that's built like Travis was saying that you can kind of anticipate where the other person might be coming from and that will build a better hypothesis in your mind in the first place when you're anticipating that because of that that um, pressure. Don't rely on someone else's thought process or experience because in team leadership uh, there may be that authoritarian model. Oh, somebody's been here 20 years and has done this and seen this uh, attack before. We know for sure that this is a wanna cry. Well, if these team members have valid points, they should have absolutely no problem explaining the supporting evidence for their theories. Uh, also be consistent in your mapping techniques and document extensively. This is a major downfall. If you're not putting the mapping techniques in a place with consistent framework and there's evidence that's left out, the whole team suffers, the whole organization suffers and the intelligence is much poorer as a result of it. 
just because you don't think that you need that information or data now, it will come in handy later to track the activity. Uh, because there are times where you'll be able to take the inductive reasoning approach and have a threat profile, but there's other times where if you can't group, you have to split and treat something as a separate subject matter, because even though in this investigation, it, not, it might not provide additional uh, attributions and hypotheses, uh, uh, there's other, other times where you may see that same piece of malware used in another investigation. So the other thing is to acknowledge the fact that we're all human, mistakes happen. It's important to correct them as soon as possible because if you withhold information after realizing uh, a mistake that you made in this documentation process or your, or your attribution, uh, you, you, you don't want the whole team to suffer. You don't want those consequences of malattribution and false intelligence. Uh, and that goes to the fact, keep track of your activity over the period of time, collect the evidence and ensure the proper uh, communication is there and have have that open communication with your team. Uh, also be cognizant of copycat attacks. There's hardly new ideas under the sun. Oftentimes they're going to borrow strategies from previously known attackers and slightly adopt. Um, and that's where the generalizations kill. If you're uncertain whether attacks or evidence or TTPs are related, you have to treat the collection as a separate grouping and incidents because later down uh, in the timeline, you'll be able to group them if they are indeed related. Real quick uh, item here. So Michael Hallman brought up a, a really great point. And he said, when do you all decide what is the right hypothesis to move forward with? How often after it's been decided is then debated again? Is there a time where it's off the table and it's been decided to move forward? Or does it really always uh, be open to interpretation and review? Getting a group of experts to agree seems inherently difficult. Indeed, that is correct, that last statement there. You want to take that, Ryan? You want me to take that one? Oh, well, you can go first. Okay. It's always time bound. Anything that's real and tell, real, real situation, there's always a threat, right? There's always a situation that is holding people's feet to the fire where you need an answer, you need it now, and you don't have two years to make a full-blown academic study with a thesis statement and, and, and an entire publication, right? So you need to give the decision makers, the, the, the commander if you're in the DOD or the director if you're in the DHS or the C, you know, COO, CEO if you're in the private sector, you need to give them your best estimate of the intelligence situation whenever they need it. And that's a, that's a challenging part for intelligence analysts you might need 48 hours to get a good handle on the situation. You might have four, you know, and that's just, that's the name of the game when it comes to the to Intel work. So anytime you give an intelligence estimate or which is, you know, what, what we call, you know, your, your, you, you, you know, your assessment of the situation, your recommendations of the situation, you are doing a, probability estimate of what you understand of the situation at that moment and it's always going to change so what, what you have to do is if the if you if the commander if the commander or the boss needs an answer in six hours you give them an answer in six hours but in six and a half hours you go back to them and say hey i've learned this new stuff this is the big important change to that previous estimate that you need to understand. And you keep doing that until the situation is resolved. And that, that's what makes Intel work a little bit different than other work is that it doesn't end until that situation is over. And that situation could be a very long process. I couldn't agree more. And, and one of the key points to, to hone in on further based on what Travis was saying is that intelligence cycle is iterative just because there are certain constraints that are in this cycle um, and you're aware of that two day time period that you have to make your best estimate. In a sense, you also have to think of yourself as an archivist because there may be further campaigns down the road that the information and work you're doing now is going to be applicable for. And so when you look at the iteration, there may be something that you missed the first time that when you're reviewing the archives and considering new evidence uh, at a later time point, may lead to a better threat profile. Yeah, and that threat profile might go on for weeks after the incident is closed out, 
right? Because just because that incident ends doesn't mean that threat as an entity ends. So even though, you know, you, this, this process that might be engaging the entire SOC and the entire threat intelligence team might, might, you know, might be contained and closed out on a Friday, the intel work of that to understand that who, what, when, where, and why, and how, that's going to continue on well beyond that. And that was in those intel estimates to make sure that the parties that understand it, the defenders, really understand what kind of threat actors are targeting them, that needs to continue on well past that to make sure that they have an understanding of the, envi of the environment even beyond that engagement. Absolutely. And one of the important rules to keep in mind when it comes to the generalizations is the rule of two. If you're using the diamond model of intrusion, you have to look for the overlaps and the intrusions in campaigns, identify unique characteristics and map them. It's a deductive reasoning strategy that's really effective. Don't ignore transport layer security because they're helpful in finding the C2 infrastructure. Think about the TLS certificate and what that evaluation provides you with. You have the subject alternative name, which identifies the host names or IP addresses associated with the certificate. Uh, you can look for self-signed or unknown suspicious certificate authorities. And then you can look at the validity period of the certificate because that also is an important attribute to understand. Has this been, uh, uh, has the lifespan of the certificate been two years or has it just been six days before the attack? Um, that provides a better indicator into which group is likely behind the attack. And then look at the certificate uh, revocation status checked by the CRL or, OSC, or OCSP. Uh, another element when considering the data is that data pivoting is essential to domain evaluation. Identify the domain and what it tells you. Start with the single attribute that the domain provides pivot, what other data points do you have that could shed light on this domain and then validate? And um, so then now going to the common attribution mistakes, don't consider a DDNS infrastructure for attribution. It's an additional cloak of anonymity. The root domain is owned by the DDNS provider while the subdomain is the attackers, but there may be providers and themes that are overlaps but these by themselves are not enough to carry forward uh, with great confidence. It's important to map out the domains and hosting IP addresses with the hopes of identifying the C2 server. Uh, when looking to see if there are multiple domains hosted on the same IP address, don't conclude their relatedness or unrelatedness without serious consideration. And this has to be rooted in research. Avoid the attribution arising from domains registered by brokers. And it's a really interesting situation, something that I just uh, learned about not too long ago. Uh, there's oftentimes many investigations that uh, provide incorrect attribution because they include all the domains registered by the same broker and say, oh, this is a single attacker, when that's actually not the case. This can mislead uh, the future cyber threat hunts. And the registration information from the brokers is worth looking into, but most of the time, uh, attackers know if there's pitfalls in data privacy and protection and will avoid them. So that's why the registration information for the brokers is not always available or reliable if it is there. So also don't automatically base attribution on publicly available hacking tools. Consider it part of the data collection necessary for documentation and analysis. Attackers will often do their best to avoid custom tooling. They're gonna to try to live off the land because the more that they give away in terms of tooling, the more attribution and intelligence is going to be gathered on them and they're aware of this. Uh, but malware is slightly different. You, when malware is first released, it's gonna be released from somewhere from a particular group, but we'll see it retooled in different campaigns. And the malware life cycle is really interesting because multiple groups can be using it within the end of the week. You have to look at the TTPs, um, look at malware zoos like virus total, hybrid analysis, Joe Sandbox, et cetera, because this is incredibly useful for CTI collection purposes. Uh, another point is to be cautious of unjudiciously incorporating trusted sources into your threat feeds. Uh, just because CrowdStrike may come out with their latest uh, CVE and publish it ahead of anybody else, 
doesn't necessarily mean that you can rely on that until the confidence level is exactly where you need it to be. Uh, oftentimes in the industry, when you hear big names, you're like, oh, this must be the case. But there has been several instances where smaller firms have actually done more extensive research uh, that reveals the malattribution that took place in establishing that theory. And that gets back to the heart of the data discrepancies. Is your internal source data matching the open source data? Are there trends? Uh, have that statistical rigor and data reliability. Let's see, are there any questions in the chat? No, Jackie had a really good one, but I think uh, Travis had the, the perfect answer to it. So, you know, her question was, how often is too often to update other team members on new Intel? And Travis said, as soon as you have verified and that information, uh, anytime that verified information changes the, the situation, Intel can always come uh, too late, but it can never come too early, which is a good rule of thumb. I would yeah. say with that thought process, especially if it's an impactful situation uh, for a, a, an organization. I think there always has to be, with any particular situation, a certain grain of thought uh, or, or, or grain of salt put into a, if a threat actor that you're tracking or a situation you're tracking is of a lower significance or importance, um, then perhaps the cadence or frequency should be adjusted based on that to not create too much noise. At the end of the day, if if you become a, a noisy resource or a data feed for, for somebody, um, then they're not going to be cognizant when you are calling out something important. So I think to to Travis's point, you know, when there is a change that uh, has has occurred, it's verified, it's impactful, right? I think that has like a a, a substance to it. That's the time to communicate it. And verify is really the key there. You, you know, as an Intel analyst, you'll get, in, you'll get information coming in all the time. Information is not intelligence, right? Information has to be processed, has to be analyzed to create intelligence. And ideally, in any reasonable case, you need to have multiple different sources for that information to validate actionable intelligence, right? If you've got one source giving you a little bit of information, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can hang your hat on it. It really depends on the source. If you provide one single source information that turns out to be not true, as an Intel analyst, that's a resume updating producing event, right? You need to make sure that you have corroborating sources, you verify that intelligence before you push it up. Because pushing up no intelligence can sometimes be worse than pushing up bad intelligence, okay? It, it's very, very, very important to either make sure that you have corroborating sources or make sure that the decision maker understands that the information you're providing them is coming from a single source. Great point. I'll skip over the diamond. I mean, I'll skip over the models uh, here so far. You can go back and review them on the webpage just for the purpose of time. It's incredibly important and interesting stuff. Um, but to kind of conclude, I'll look to talk about uh, communicating findings. Knowing your audience well is important. Is your deliverable presented and written in a way that the personnel present at the meeting can understand? Are you talking to the CISO, network defenders, or other roles? The context for your deliverable matters. Understanding your role as a cyber threat intelligence analyst is important. You're a tactician ultimately at heart. You're there to provide real-time intelligence and making sure that you have your data feeds where they need to be to provide that intelligence is important. It's, it's important not to be caught unprepared to the best of your ability. And then understanding the purpose of the communication uh, which purpose is it for? Is it strategic, operational, ta tactical, or technical? Or is it a combination somewhere there up? Uh, also, you have to develop storytelling skills because CTI is not only about telling the war stories, but how the history meets today's threat environment and why that matters for a company, how it affects their top line and bottom line. And you have to be able to deliver a full cycle CTI topic discussion. Uh, Consider the variations in learning styles of the individuals, have effective visualizations, summary sheets, and always leave time for questions and discussions. Having everybody on the same page when it comes to a 
uh, CTI strategy is incredibly important. When it comes to the documentation, ensure that it's complete, accurate, and effective. Focus on the metrics that matter. Data is only as effective as its visualizations and implications. Why is this graph important to me? How is this going to affect operational capacity? These are the questions that, that CISOs want to know and CEOs as well. And so basically give them directly what they're looking for. Uh, also, clearly define your requests when you're asking for something and how those requests will allow your team to accomplish the mission and objective in a more timely fashion. Because of the importance of timely intelligence, that could be a, a discussion point in, in, in making an internal business case as to why you need this additional skill set within your team and why you need an additional team member. Also, remember what the components of the assessment are how competent you are, what the analysis shows, what the evidence is, and where your sources are coming from. Because if there's a source that you're leaving out, that can change out the entire picture. And staying up to date with the latest trends through reliable news sources, podcasts, social media content, books, courses, and the dark web uh, is a really great way to, to be in the know and to provide that timely intelligence in the context for any new situation that you face. So thank you so much, everybody. And if there's any questions, we'll be happy to uh, take them. I'll just add that from all the things I've said, people are probably dissuaded from a career in intelligence because they're talking about how, how hard it is and how uh, you know it's a constant thing. It is an incredibly rewarding career. It is very challenging but it is having your fingers on the pulse of things that are really really important at the time that they are and it is super super cool um when when you do look at it though if that is a path that you're looking to explore either as a cyber threat intelligence or just as an intelligence analyst for any of the any particular agency or organization be aware though that as an intelligence analyst or intelligence officer, whatever you may be, you are an enabler to the decision maker. You are not the decision maker. And that can be something that people don't really understand, especially in uh, analog military organizations. I, I've had many uh, instances, and I'm sure Dane has as well here, where I've had very solid intel. Like I've had um, geospatial you know, satellite imagery there, you know, the enemy is aligned this way. I've had signals intelligence. The enemy is aligned this way. I recommend to the commander, you should do this thing because the enemy is aligned this way. And they say, no, fuck you. I'm doing it, doing it my way. Okay. Sometimes you just have to understand, like you provide the intelligence estimate. You provide that intel. The decision maker makes the decision. Sometimes they will follow your recommendation. Sometimes they will not. And you have to be okay with that and that can be a very challenging very emotional event for some people in the intel community it is a part of the game but i'll tell you that it is a very 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 rewarding uh career field if that is something that you want to do so fantastic points and thank you for for noting that travis one of the things i want to demarcate on for for everyone to know is so the majority of what you and Dana have been speaking to is based on your military experience in general intelligence, correct? Not as much cyber threat intelligence for the military, correct? Uh, some degree of cyber threat intelligence for the military, but general military intelligence, correct? Okay, stupendous. So uh, one of the things that um, from an insight standpoint, so Ryan, based on your research and what you've seen experience wise, what are some of the key differences that exists when it comes to cyber threat intelligence between the military, regular federal government agencies like CISA and enterprises? Sure, so the, the key thing is actually the chain of command and how that follows. I would say widely varies, not necessarily so much between the government and the military, but also especially within organizations. Also the constraints that they're facing are entirely different in landscapes. Uh, businesses, often don't have the, the 
infrastructure and the budget to be able to hold a full CTI team because it's very costly, as I discussed before, whereas that's not usually a problem for the government or the military. In fact, there could be so many sources of intelligence that it becomes impossible to sort through in a timely manner. And that's a different limitation that the government and the military is facing, but it's also because they're looking primarily after advanced persistent threats, not that businesses aren't. Uh, for example, Sony, they were hit by North Korea. Uh, and that's an important consideration that businesses aren't always exempt from, from APTs. And, and another reason uh, that it's important to have a full build out uh, capability in your CTI department, uh, because Sony was financially ruined. Uh, I think they were projected to make like $80, $80 billion from that movie and instead grossed less than $8 million in the end. So it was a huge loss. Uh, from something so simple. And then the, the last thing is also the skill set and training uh, is widely varying in cyber threat intelligence, because unlike something in, in patent testing, where there's a little bit more well-defined uh, history of what a good pen tester is in terms of education, uh, skills, and experiences, in cyber threat intelligence, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, like, for example, if I go on LinkedIn right now and I ask 20 people in cyber threat intelligence, what are some of their recommended uh, certifications? They're all going to come up with different answers for the most part. They'll say there's fundamental knowledge like Security Plus and perhaps uh, CISA Plus. But beyond that, they'll say that the certs are very niche. So then you're looking at things like oh, is, is somebody more of a general analyst or are they doing endpoint detection and response? Because that education is going to widely differ. And so those are just some of the things that uh, differ between all of the uh, organizations in terms of size and capacity. Wow, we, that was a really great breakdown. Thank you for that insight. And then for someone who might be interested in deep diving into CTI and playing with some of the yeah, you know, initial open source tools, what would be like two or three open source tools that you would suggest for them to start kind of playing with if they were intrigued? Well, for, for open source tooling, there's such a wide landscape when it, when it comes to that. But honestly, doing web scraping is incredibly effective for open source intelligence. Scraping Twitter, uh, looking to connect through the dark web and finding different forums, are often times where you're gonna find the latest developments and what people want to know. I think a while back you did the uh, OSINT tooling, Travis. What were some of your favorites? For, for general OSINT, oh, there's a ton of them. I mean, there's Harvester, you know, less of mass. I mean, there's, there's here, I'll, po I'll post a link to that particular resource into the chat. So that, that's great for open source intelligence gathering for pen testing. But what I was actually hoping is, so we did a whole session on Multigo. Multigo is, is one of the premier tools that is not open source, but it is free. We have a session on it. Travis, you could post the link for that as well. That would be fantastic. But Multigo is a fantastic solution for being able to collect, scrape, and gather massive amounts of data into a singular place and then to take that data categorize it and visualize it which is very very helpful for cti teams to be able to determine some of the patterns between things and how they kind of connect together and this way they can kind of be able to establish maybe certain pieces of evidence corroborating one another right and then be able to establish who that particular threat actor might be that kind of stuff um I think, uh, Ryan, one of the ones that actually I think you, you've played with quite a bit and, you know, this works well to your, your data science background is Elk Stacks, right? Last to search log stash in Kibana, right? And pretty much every major sim out there, uh, at least, I mean, at least the open source based ones like Waza, right? Uh, leverage ELK stacks, right? And so I think that in, in my professional opinion, if someone asked me, hey, I'm, I'm looking to get into CTI, I want to learn more, I want to dig in, I would say get familiar with working with Elk Stacks and being able to spin one up. And certainly, you know, starting with a, an easy open source, you know, sim like Wizza is a great way to kind of do that. Um, do any other good tools or solutions come into everyone else's mind? No? Okay. Um, give me one second, one second. I know we got just a couple more moments here. I would say 
Mm. If there's another tool that I would recommend when it comes to threat intelligence, believe it or not, it's adjacent with forensic analysis. Uh, because usually what happens is when a malicious actor starts to gain access to systems or they're, they're starting to attempt something and they start to hit your radar from a threat intelligence standpoint, they've already done some level of damage. And so uh, Autopsy has been a fantastic open source tool that I've leveraged in the past that when a particular system like on the outer echelons or outer shell of an organization gets compromised, right, or I need to pull a bunch of logs and data from it, I can quickly image it and then analyze the entire file system, all the event logs, and it'll look at all the metadata and break it down into beautiful timelines. So again, it's a fantastic tool. And I think that that can help threat intelligence analysts being able to then pull back and look at what those timelines are, what artifacts are on a particular file system or on a particular server, and then line that back to some of the TTPs that they might see against like the MITRE attack framework and that kind of stuff. Now, I know that we're just about at time here, but Ryan, you did a fantastic job of breaking down some of those models and you called out the, the MITRE attack framework ab above. And there's a little breakdown for everyone on that. I would say, you know, uh, for everyone who's on the call with us, take the opportunity to go through this in, in further detail and 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 dig into that it's particularly helpful because the minor attack framework what's really really cool with all those ttps so you know when you, a malicious actor is gaining access to a set of systems and they're trying to compromise an organization and you know they perform lateral movement and persistence and all that kind of stuff they're leveraging the same types of tools the same type of methodologies the same type of techniques they're always targeting the same type of organizations like fin7 always like to likes to go after a certain set of organizations with a certain set of vulnerabilities so what you can do with the MITRE attack framework is once you start to identify some of the ttps with the potential malicious actor you're working with you can actually map that back to an advanced persistent threat that's then documented in the MITRE attack framework and then you can see the shit that they're going to try next you can see all the other things that they're going to try to pull next, all the other tools that they're going to try to utilize next, all the other vulnerabilities and weaknesses that they're trying to look for, right? This way, it gets you ahead of the curve of when you see a threat actor trying to attempt something and you can profile them, you can identify characteristically what they might try to do to you in the future. And here, I'll just provide one quick little example for folks in the chat. Here is a great example of like a ETP 12. So this is group five uh, when it comes to, you know, the minor attack framework. Just drop that right in the chat. So again, with the minor attack framework, we can essentially track adversaries. We can compartmentalize them, categorize them down to their TTPs. Once we start to identify who's trying to pull shit against the organization, who's targeting the organization, then we know what type of stuff they might try in the future. We can then focus our priorities and our time and our energy and our resources to those particular strongholds, which we believe they're going to try to attack next. So to that, Ryan, any closing items that you want to hit on or anything like that? Well, I think the the important thing now is you can see the utility and build out of what a cti team can do for you and your organization and that it should be considered part of a security budget like sony was my case in point uh no one is exempt from trying to defend outside of the castle because by the time that threats are reaching your network it's already too late if you don't have an idea of how to contain and respond and the the effects of the attack on your top and bottom line for a business, but also on national security as a whole when it comes to things like critical infrastructure. If railroads come screeching to a halt and airplanes shut down, it's a very scary day. And so that's why providing timely intelligence and making sure to keep that in mind when you're going about the rest of your studies and kind of taking the framework of how a threat intelligence analyst might think uh, could provide a greater benefit, both as like a SOC analyst, as a pen tester, and pretty much in every facet of cybersecurity. So if there's any time you all want to discuss anything in uh, cyber threat intelligence, I'm always around and feel free to shoot me a message. Well, fantastic. And thank you so much again for, for hosting this Cyber Judo for us. We really appreciate it. We'll be setting this up on YouTube fairly soon so everyone can else uh, can see it. And Ryan, anytime where we can collaborate, we would love to do more. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I truly enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Fantastic. Team, 
really appreciate everyone's time tonight. Again, we'll be posting this to YouTube fairly soon. And uh, Travis, before we let everybody go, the next cyber judo topic, what are we going to be looking at here? I think you had one that was lined up, but I'm not entirely certain. I just want to check how is it coming along. I think we actually kind of hit on a lot of what I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about the intelligence cycle in cybersecurity. I think we peppered that in this, this round. So I think we'll have to uh, hit the drawing boards for next week to come up with a great new topic. Okay, cool. Well, we'll we'll brainstorm and we'll be following up with everybody soon enough on LinkedIn. Team, thank you so much again. Have a fantastic night. Bye now. Take care. See you guys.